Hi everybody, it's Michael Dunaway. I'm the film editor for Paste Magazine, and I am absolutely thrilled because we are with one of my entertainment icons, oh. and uh, certainly no stranger to Paste readers, Mr. Mark Barron. Thank you, thanks for having me. Which is my camera? This, which one? <laughs> That's okay, good. <laughs> Um, Mark uh, has had uh, many lives as an entertainer, of course, but uh, is perhaps best known to Paste fans as the uh, proprietor of the WTF podcast. I'm a proprietor now? <laughs> Not absolutely, a host? Absolutely. I'm a proprietor of, of talk. <laughs> I'm the, glad that people know me as an entertainer. I, I just started realizing I was one a couple of years ago. I yeah. appreciate that. It was yeah. very nice of you. The mag How about the magnate? The magnate of the WTF empire? I, I, I prefer a guy who needs a lot of attention. Could you intro <laughs> me like that? Here's a guy that needs a lot of attention. <laughs> Um, well, let's start out. We're going to talk about the uh, the TV show in just a few minutes, but I want to start out talking a little bit about the podcast. Tell, first of all, talk a little bit about sort of your uh, your entry into the podcast world. What sort of sparked sure, that? Sure. And, yeah. Well, that was a very focused uh, period of desperation for me. So it was completely fueled by need to continue doing something. Yeah. Uh, at the time I uh, started the podcast, I was. Uh, in some sort of fourth cycle of a job at Air America Radio. I'd been fired three times before, and I went back there, you know, groveling uh, for some free money so I could get out of a divorce. And I did a video show for them for about a year that absolutely nobody watched. <laughs> and, uh, and then they ran out of money. But being the good progressives that they were, they fired us, but said, but you're on contract with your office for another month, and you can keep your security cards. And we thought, well, this is perfect. We can break into the studio at night and start doing this other thing. So that's how it started. Uh, the only decision we really made at that time was to do two a week, no matter what. And I made a, a, a fairly deep commitment to never talk about partisan politics unless it directly affected me. Because I thought that was bullshit. Am I right? Come on. <laughs> How long do you got to talk about politics before you realize you're just a hate puppet for other interests? And even if you're angry, it might not be about that. Why don't we go deeper? What are you really angry about? Huh? What are you? <laughs> Me. What am yeah. I angry about? Gosh. Where, where should we start? Oh, see, now it's my show. <laughs> no, but, you know, what you're touching on, actually, the whole anger thing is, of course, one of the, I think, one of the keys to what brings me back to the podcast. First of all, obviously, you're a very funny guy. Obviously, you're a very good interviewer. Um, but I love the concept of not only you having people on and sort of helping them, really helping them work through some of their shit. <laughs> But then, that's, but that's the, all I'm there for. But then there's yeah. this meta narrative too of you working through your shit through working through their shit. Yeah, that's the big trick. Is like you know, all I needed to do was talk to people. So why not put the mics on? I just needed to you know literally connect with people. You know, my shows are very personal. I, I don't hold much back. And really, at the beginning, I just really needed to talk to people and peers. And so that began that narrative. And, and I've worked through a lot of stuff on the podcast. And a lot of fans are just hoping I don't get my shit together because they're concerned that, like, hey, if Marin gets everything that he wants going on, he's going to be sort of a bore. And I'm afraid of that, too. You know, God forbid I feel good about myself because then what do I do with my career? That'll be the day that I retire. Hey, I'm okay. I'm done. There. That's, uh, that's it. But, you know, it's, a, it's really... You know, it's one thing to say, yeah, I'm going to get into some psychological shit on the show and maybe I'll talk about myself some, but there's such a courage in, and an openness in what you do that it's really, it's really actually touching. I don't, well, that's because, uh, you know, I don't know why that happens. I really, I, I, there's no system to it. I, I think that, you, you know, generally I'm going in only to have a conversation. I don't expect people, like for a while people were like, you know, you're going to do Marin's podcast. Like Bobby Slayton came on, and most people don't know Bobby Slayton, but like throughout the entire interview, he's like, you're going to make me cry like Louis C.K.? <laughs> you know, and, and like I don't expect those things to happen. I just make myself as emotionally available as possible for whatever conversation that unfolds. I don't prepare much, and that's the truth. I, I just don't. You know, I try to make sure I don't leave an interview and say, like, oh, shit, he won an Oscar. Why didn't I talk about that? You know, I want to make sure I know important junctures in people's career or lives. But usually I just want the conversation at some point to get past their public narrative, to get past um, whatever they think is supposed to happen when they're on a microphone, and just be two people talking. It's not essential to me that it's about anything specific because I think when you're dealing with audio specifically you can hear a change in emotion you can hear the nuances of people's voice and what their what their passions are what their feelings are so almost always uh, about if it's a tough interview 
about two-thirds of the way through, something just gives. And it's not necessarily some big moment or, or some big bit of information about somebody. It's just something just relaxes. You can't bullshit for you know, uh, an hour, even if you're not trying to bullshit. If you're sitting there talking to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, eventually you know, you're going to be like, what? You know, and then that's, I, that's the moment you're looking for. Okay, did you, did you get enough? You know. <laughs> well, especially with you. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to, it would be hard to keep a, f a front with you for long. First of all, because you're a freaking bulldog when it comes to get, but, getting but, people to open up. But, I'm not but also because you're open too. Right, I'm open, but I'm not courting controversy. I mean, there have right. been times where people have said to me before an interview, like, you know, I don't want to talk about the guy I murdered, you know, because it's like we're still in court. And I'm like, I can respect that. that it's was a good bigly, story. Wasn't it? No, it was Andy Dick. <laughs> But uh, no, it wasn't. E it wasn't either of them. You know, for Biglia. No, I mean that guy's you know calculating even when he's not being calculating. That's an amazing skill. There's multi levels. Uh, but I love him. See, that's a that's always a good thing when you got to say that after you've said something shitty. Great guy though, right? Great guy. Um, if a comic, if a comics talk about a comic they don't think are funny, yeah. nice guy. Nice, nice guy. guy. <laughs> Yeah, I've worked with him. Really great guy. Super nice. We went to the mall. It was nice. Um, but uh, what, what were we saying? Oh, so like, I'm not, I'm not really courting controversy. You know, I don't want to make people uncomfortable. You know, if they're going to talk about whatever they're going to talk, I just want to be available for the conversation. No. And if you're, if it's, if it's one on one, like when I talk to Mel Brooks or Robin Williams, there's certain people performers that, you know, if there's more than one person in a room and somebody's an innate performer, they're going to, you know, they're going to turn it on, even sure. if it's two people. Sure. You know, but like I'm, you know, when I did Mel Brooks, you know, it was just him and I is the middle of the day. And, you know, I got something very, you know, candid because I was just available for the conversation. Same with Robin. You know, it was just him and I at his house. And that would be weird if he started going, ooh, what have we got? What are we doing? You know? And, you know, he didn't do that, you know, because it would have been awkward. Right. You know, really? At home you do this? Um, so that, that's really it, is that, you know, I will, whatever people want to volunteer, whatever comfort level they, they are at or whatever they want to talk about, is just to be available for it. And I was a fairly selfish person for most of my life and becoming an empathetic listener or, or just letting people talk, which I'm not always good at. I still get criticism. It's like, you know, with people, and I don't even know I'm doing it, but I get people writing emails. It's like, why don't you let your guest finish a sentence? I'm like, because I think I know what they're going to say. I'm just a person and I want to move on. <laughs> but, 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 uh, but that's gotten less but it's like jay it's like jay moore says it's like you know in, in, in any group of are you quoting jay moore yeah, to I my am. face I'm sorry in any out group of all of the people in the world it's like <laughs> as, uh, the scholar jay moore <laughs> in between impressions and sports talk said something what what did he say no he's like in any group of 100 fans there's always going to be like two that are total batshit crazy you know, yes, and, so, and, and those, they're not going to get it. And, and I have all of those people, <laughs> all of my fans. You know, like if you do the numbers proportionately, if you used 100 fans as all the fans available, the batshit crazy, hypersensitive, a right. little displaced ones are my people. No, no but, but there's no, always th one or two that are not going to get what you're going after, and they're going to say the problem with your show is that you talk too much. Yeah, and, and actually, those that's are the, the key. Those are the people that I choose to engage with on Twitter, you know, publicly <laughs> for 20 minutes and, right. until I lose. Right. <laughs> um. Well, let's. Oh, I have one more question on the podcast too. Do you feel like the the format of the podcast and the fact that there's that you can you started and it was basically yours to do and there was not a studio exec standing over you saying this is not working, that's not working. Do you feel like you were working through to get to what you wanted to get to as far as the format of the show and the whole point of well, the yeah, show? Well, yeah, at the beginning, you know, we you know I came out of. Uh, I, I'm not a, a, a radio veteran or or anything like that. I, I don't claim that. You know, radio guys are you know their own thing, and you know I'm not going to you know claim that I was a radio guy. Uh, and I have a lot of respect for radio guys, but I just found that talking on that mic, you know, was something that I could do. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, everybody thinks they can talk on a mic and be inherently interesting. I don't know what makes my voice uh, compelling in that format, but I, I knew that it was. Yeah. So I wanted to do, I wanted to work with that, yeah. that mic, you know, audio. And at the beginning, you know, we had other people in the room sometimes. We had more than one guest. We did phoners. And then when I moved to L.A., we had third acts that were guests that may or may not have been real. But then eventually it just became about the conversation. So 
Uh, yeah, no uh, meddling by producers or corporate entities is always good for anybody. Uh, and, but, but then even when you're doing that, you're like, it's only a matter of time, man. You know, they're like, no matter what you're doing on a DIY, a DIY level, you know, there's that part of you that's sort of like, we got, someone's going to figure out how to fuck us. All right, so let's just try to use this freedom before we're being fucked by somebody. And then you cut to a commercial. You, you know, that's how it works. It's like, and, but then you sort of ride on that credibility. It's sort of like, well, I'm only going to talk, I'm only going to do advertising for, for things I can sell. And in my voice, I'm not going to run any pre-records. And you can do that, you know, but eventually, you know, I was not a guy. I'm not a business guy. If I was a business guy, what, you think I'd be doing this? <laughs> no, I, and I was a guy that, that was compelled to express myself in a certain way. So, so now that all of a sudden we're sitting on all these listeners, you know, eventually you get to the point, it's like, hey, you know, there's like 300,000 people listening. Should we be making something? <laughs> There's 300,000 of them. If they could just send us a quarter a day, that would be great. How can we make them send us a quarter? Uh, and then they don't. Usually you can only get a few of them to send you a quarter. But, uh, but ultimately a business sort of evolved out of this thing that we still have you know, full control over. And, and um, we try to you know, only do ads. Like there's certain things I can't sell. I can sell dildos. I can sell stamps. I can sell um, some things I don't quite understand, but they seem like good things. But like, you know, dildos and stamps, what else do you need? Really? That's right. That, absolutely. <laughs> and you can mail your dildos to others. <laughs> right. There's nothing like sharing dildos to the U.S. Postal Service. But, um, you know, but there's some things we tried and it didn't work. Like, you know, they wanted us to sell the man great. And, you know, and I'm like, you know, I don't think my people are really man great people. It's basically a grill attachment. Right. I remember that because we told the guy, we're like, you know, I'm not, you know, my people aren't grillers, you know, by, I, I just got a feeling that the people that listen to my show aren't sort of like, let's get some meat on that thing, you know. And, you know, we told the guy, and he's like, no, no, it's going to work great. We ran the ad once, and the guy calls us up, panic, like, hey, it's, it's not working out. Exactly. It, well, we have a, just, just, we just won't do it anymore. Relax, you know. Uh, we, so, got some, yeah. we got some good T-bones. We got the new WTF podcast. It's yeah, going to be yeah. a night. It's I just don't see that night. those are my dudes. It's <laughs> like, man, I was listening to Mark Marin today in between that and watching the game. You know, I, it's just not, I'm not, I, I got nothing against those people. I just, I think those are the people that be like, what do you do? You know, so. Um, well, speaking of sort of uh, waiting to see how they're going to fuck you, I know that you've, you've been outspoken about uh, the, uh, this whole patent trolling thing, trying to, trying to shut down the whole podcasting thing. Why don't, we, why don't you talk a little bit about that and your perspective on... Look at you slipping the big shit in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just going to lube him up a little with stuff about him. Then drop the patent troll bomb. Right, let's, right. uh, let's get some real news out of this. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> that was, you know, patent trolling is something that was new to me. You know, I didn't know anything about it. I'm not a tech guy. You know, I'm a guy that, you know, records a thing in my garage and then my buddy puts it up on the thing. Yeah. That's my knowledge of how it works. So wait, I just turn it on and then, oh, la, 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 great. And then you'll do the rest. So that's, that's me. And that's any podcaster, give or yeah. take a yeah. guy. Um, so then all of a sudden this patent troll thing happens and I'm like, what, what is this? You know, I get a call from Sam Cedar. He's like, did you get a, a letter from this, this personal audio? And I'm like, I don't know. And then I get it and it's like basically this, we're, we're inviting you to license the patent for podcasting. And then there's that moment where you're like, this isn't real, right? And then there's a whole patent in there and I'm like, what, what is this? And then I find out they're suing Corolla. You know, for, basically patent trolls are, from what I understand, and again, I'm no pro at this. But it's been a plague in the tech industry for a long time. And it's, it's basically, there's a pre-existing patent or there's a new patent on a math problem or, or software as they'd like to call it, but they don't make anything, right? So they've got this patent for a math problem that, that if you, you know, use this math problem, it will do a certain thing. So there was a patent hanging around from 1996 for, for sequence, menu sequencing, something that is delivered episodically on a computer in a sequence uh, through uh, a menu. So that was out there. So then some genius goes, well, we got to broaden this thing and repatent it so it covers just about everything anyone could do on a computer and then start, you know, shaking down these idiots who are talking on mics in their mom's house. Um, so when you really talk about it, so they sued uh, Adam and they sued uh, how it works 
podcast, that's Discovery Channel. Yeah. But the problem is, is that like everybody in this room is sort of like, well, that's crazy. That's that's got to be bullshit. Yeah, th it is bullshit and it is crazy, but it's going to cost about a million dollars sure. for someone to make that legal, right. to legally say this is bullshit. So do I have a million dollars? Sure. No. So what does that mean? That means you're in a position to either just, you know, get hit with legal costs or say to the person, how much do you want to, to leave me alone? Away. Right. Not even make it go away. It's straight up racket. It's BS. straight up extortion. It's yeah. not even BS. It's it should be illegal because you're saying like, all right, how much will it take for yep. me to get you to leave me alone yep. to, to, from you? Protect yep. me from you. Yep. Straight up fucking mob bullshit. All right. So clearly I have feelings about this now. <laughs> Angry Mark Marin is in the house. But I don't talk about politics unless it's up my ass. Do you understand? <laughs> and like, arguably, you can make that about any sort of politics. But this is specifically, I have a letter that shows someone's trying to fuck me with support from the U.S. patent system and the U.S. government. So, um, all right. So what's going on now is that, you know, I reached out to a bunch of podcasters. And I said, hey, you guys, you know, we hang out sometimes, but, you know, we're all in the same business. You think we could try to, you know, get together on this and try to, you know, see what, how we can help Adam? What's the real story about this? I reached out to the Electronic uh, uh, Frontier Foundation and they're on top of this shit. So there's a lot of activity around you know, we sort of push some people to support some legislation called the Shield Bill. This is this is how you know something's fucked up. Is that if the best you can do at this moment for this problem is to get Congress to pass a law that would say if somebody sues you frivolously on a patent, that if they lose, you have to pay the other guy's legal bills. If that's the best you can do, that's a problem. You know, like so, because the thing cuts both ways for big corporations tech corporations that own patents, this protects their device and they like to sue each other for lots of money. But I think what's happening now, and I think what people have to be aware of, is that content providers, you know, guys who are just like, hey man, I'm just doing this thing and I'm putting my shit out in the world through something that should theoretically be a free zone, yep. are being bullied and extorted by these things. Yep. So what they've done, this particular patent troll has put a human face on this with us, and you know it's it's a real problem, and and I don't know what's going to happen with it, but it's uh, it's almost like someone saying, you know, I own the patent on the if if television at some point, like well the guy who owns the patent on the vacuum tube, yeah. like you can turn your TV on, that'll be five dollars if you watch it for a few hours. Let me know how much you watch it. Well, I guess that's called cable now, but that's what I'm. What the point is is that it, it's not they don't make anything, man, yep. and it's yep. it's strictly an extortion racket. Well, that's the heart of what makes it the most, oh, I'm going to get on the soapbox too, the most evil in my, in my mind. It's like, I don't, have the, I don't have the creativity to do something myself to add something to the world to make some money. So not only am I going to just be frustrated about that, I'm actually going to go to the people that are doing something good in the world and I'm going to wet my beak there, you know? Well, I, I, you, you know, I, I like, because I like that you do that because I think that, um, that in my mind, I'd like to give them that, that there is that sort of like, you know, creative frustration in them. <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's always been my belief that, you know, lawyers are generally charismatic sort of creative people, but they just didn't have the courage to follow through. So now we're all going to pay for it. That's right. That's um, right. That's right. You know, I, I mean, I, I'd like to think that's true, but I think these guys, they, you know, obviously they've compromised their conscience to a point to think this is valid. And no matter, the problem about it is, is that when you got, you're attacking a bunch of guys that all they do is talk about shit. Like, you'd like to think that's, that's powerful enough. I mean, you know, un, you know, fortunately and unfortunately, grassroots activity is the only thing that can sort of give momentum to change. Yeah. But me sitting there going, hey, these guys are assholes. <laughs> well, you think they care? If they're looking for friends, they're in the wrong fucking business. Right. They don't that's give right. a shit. That's right. That's right. Do you? <laughs> All right. Well, let's take you back to your happy place. We've gone to Angry Mark Marin. Let's go back to the happy place because now things are so good and people love you so much that not only do you have... You know, you're nervous that you most... push me over the edge, aren't you? <laughs> I gotta pull you back. Now before you gotta see you go. if your charm we can don't save make that this kind of, thing. We don't want to make that kind of news at South by. <laughs> yeah, uh, you don't, huh? But now people are loving you so much that not only do you have, you know, the top podcast around, but now television too. For those of us that two times a week, Marin uh, for an hour and a half is not enough mm -hmm. uh, on the podcast. We yeah, I got a on book TV coming too. out too. There's gonna be a lot of Marin <laughs> available. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the show is, uh, it looks great. You know, we did a we did an, a, a great job representing me, I, I believe. Uh, Marin is a half hour scripted comedy that's going to be premiering on IFC May 3rd. Uh, we did 10 episodes. Uh, it's 
it's basically based on my life. It's uh, it's about a comic who's hit the you know hit the wall and started doing a podcast in his garage. And a lot of the stories are taken from my life. Some of the stories you'll be familiar with, but they're in a different format. Mm -hmm. So don't be like, was Marinette a shit? No, you know it's a different format. Right. But um, but a lot of uh, celebrities who have been on the podcast are playing themselves in the show as podcast guests briefly. Some of them are integrated into the narrative, uh, like Jeff Garland and Dave Foley, and um, who else was part of a, Ileana Douglas plays herself mm -hmm. through a, an episode, but Mark Duplass is on, Aubrey Plaza, Adam Scott, Dennis Leary, Holy Bobby crap. Slayton. Holy crap. Uh, Andy Kenward plays my buddy. Uh, there's a, you know, a, it's it's good, man. You know, it's, it's pretty... Uh, like I watch it and I'm, it makes me uncomfortable because I'm like, oh, this is real. Like I like Judd Hirsch plays my dad, and he's much nicer than my dad. And I'm like, I'm very concerned that my father's going to get upset about the story, but I I think that I'm preparing to tell him that Judd Hirsch is a much nicer version of him, so he should be happy that I use such a pleasant man to represent him. We'll see if that works. But it's good. It's going to be good. Good. Yeah. So May third. Yeah. May third. IFC. IFC. Yeah. Book got a street date for the book yet? April 30th on the book Attempting Normal. Oh, boy. There you go. Going to be a big yeah. few days for you. April 30th, Attempting Normal. <laughs> I May am on 3rd. the precipice of such potential failure. It's spectacular. <laughs> People can now just turn on me in, in several mediums. <laughs> there you go. Is that the wrong way to look at it? Let's put a positive spin. I'm thrilled that this much of my work is going to be out there, and I hope people enjoy it. <laughs>